A common strategy deployed by establishment parties to curb a potential populist uprising is the denigration and social ostracism of the populists. This has come to be termed the cordon sanitaire approach. Indeed, the term cordon sanitaire was first applied to politics in this very context. It was used to describe the establishment orchestrated isolation of the Flams Bloc in Belgium. All parties signed an agreement to never cooperate with the bloc, and thus they blocked it from wielding any political power. Searching for examples of this with right wing parties isn't difficult. Examples abound. The centre parties in the Netherlands, the Sweden Democrats in Sweden, the BNP in Britain, the Front National in France, the NPD in Germany, the Flams Bloc in Belgium, I could continue. Should note that this isn't to say that left-wing groups are never affected, they tend to be only in Eastern Europe. The Communist Party of the Czech Republic is a good example of a left-wing outfit that, despite gaining consistently considerable support, will never be able to enter government. The reasons for this strategy are obvious. It hugely curtails the ability of the populists to mobilise. It dissuades voters. After all, why vote for a party that will never be able to influence policy? However, there is another notable side effect. A cordon sanitaire doesn't necessarily solely indicate political alienation, but also cultural. Parties subject to said treatment often are ridiculed, shunned and rejected by civil society too. Media condemnation, anti-fascist activism, job discrimination, social ostracism all have a huge impact on the viability of a political party. How well a party fares isn't always so much to do with public sympathy with the issues they present, but more about how ideas are presented and who is presenting them. In political science they call this the supply side factors. In Britain, for example, immigration has consistently been one of the biggest issues facing the country in the eyes of the public, but never has, say, the National Front or the BNP gained a major foothold. Moreover, never would they. This is because the parties are indelibly chock-a-block with extremists. So why don't they just moderate themselves and push forward? Well, they've never been offered the inclusion that would facilitate it. Extremist parties can and do moderate but usually only in response to inclusion in the broader framework of democratic politics. In order to attain votes, extremist parties must broaden their base from core supporters to other more casual centrists. Moreover, the process of building the party organisationally, financial management, bureaucratic infrastructure, managing campaigns, etc., all move resources away from more controversial political activities and towards more conventional political practice. Once a party starts to gain governmental experience, further moderation is likely to take place, as other policy issues falling outside the core ideological scope of the party become more pressing. Put it this way, it's a lot harder to decry miscegenation when potholes in the road need filling and rubbish needs collecting on time. All the while this process is rolling on, new party recruits join. These tend to be more moderate than the initial hardcore of supporters. As party composition transforms and moderates flood the rank and file, the process of moderation intensifies. This may alienate the more original hardline supporters, but it does so in return for electoral viability, and with greater electoral viability comes greater involvement in the political process. The point is, political inclusion in general ferments political moderation, which, in general, increases public support. Examples of this process in action abound, the French Front National throughout the early 80s, the Austrian FPO throughout the 90s, Jobbik in Hungary and the Movimento Sociale, which became the National Alliance in Italy. Question is, why would establishment parties ever include potential competitors, give them legitimacy and allow them to moderate? Well, let's be cynical. Often throughout Europe, government coalitions are the norm. Parties from one side of the ideological fence may prefer legitimacy to a rising competitor in an attempt to split the vote of their rivals. The SPOA did this with the FPOA when they were led by Norbert Steger in the mid-80s. Maybe a party has to be given legitimacy to form a governing coalition, as Berlusconi did with the Movimento Sociale. These are only two of a host of potential reasons and examples. However, the point is that establishment parties often do have a rationale for lending a helping hand. However, what about when political inclusion is not an option for the establishment? This essentially guarantees a party's place in the political wilderness. 
This is because it has a large influence over the membership composition of the party. If the costs of membership are high socially, then only the most committed ideological and extreme recruits will remain, or more bluntly, those that have the least to lose socially. The party thus retains its extremist ideology, which alienates the majority of the electorate. This is the domain of the neo-Nazi. In a way, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. State and non-state actors alike can vilify a party to the point that, if it isn't already teeming with political undesirables, it will be before long. So, the conundrum for the establishment is which approach to take. Should they aim to include the insurgent, or should they reject them? The former strategy often results in their moderation, but could result in them becoming a significant electoral threat, i.e. the FPOA in Austria. The latter strategy basically guarantees political alienation for the group and can work, an example being the Republicans in Germany. But if, say, the group are violent or have widespread support in specific locales, this could prove more problematic for other reasons. The Golden Dawn would be a good example of this, and then maybe banning is an idea entertained. Moreover, sometimes groups, despite rejection from the establishment, attempt tooth and nail to moderate regardless. A prime example of this would be the BNP under Griffin or the NPD under the leadership of Udo Voigt in the mid-90s. This is an incredibly risky strategy for the party, as they run the risk of alienating their staunch core of supporters without already having a reliable contingent of moderates to take the reins, and has tended to finish in disaster. This situation is made increasingly cumbersome when we take into account party infiltration by both state and non-state actors. If the state has knuckled down on a cordon sanitaire, the last thing they want is for a party to continue to grow regardless, such as the Sweden Democrats in Sweden or the Flams Bloc in Belgium. In order to prevent this, the state has been known to install state operatives in a party to keep the party chugging in an unpalatable direction, or to sow division to split parties down the middle. This may seem fanciful, but really is quite well documented. The NPD is an excellent case in point. The party was, and is, so well infiltrated that attempts to ban the party have all but failed because incriminating materials have consistently turned out to be produced by state infiltrators. Indeed, some German politicians advise against banning the party, as it provides the state with key information on neo-Nazi activity. The British National Party is another case in point, Indeed, the very founding of the party was at the behest of state informant Ray Hill, the previous deputy leader of the neo-Nazi British movement, who was able to form a pretty cosy relationship with Tyndall and aimed to split the British nationalist right down the middle. There is also a strong likelihood that Combat 18 leader Charlie Sargent was working closely with British intelligence. Combat 18 were a huge thorn in the side of the BNP throughout the early 90s, especially after their attempt towards moderation post their 1993 Tower Hamlets success. What is striking about all the above examples is that, on the whole, with very few examples to the contrary, neo-Nazis and other extreme political actors are actually useful to the establishment. They enable the establishment to cordon off certain political topics, which makes simply voicing them problematic and alienating. Sweden's treatment of the Sweden Democrats and Germany's treatment of the NPD are examples of this, all establishment parties agreed to never politicise the issue of immigration in Sweden. This meant anyone that did step over the line was instantly tarred with the brush of the then neo-Nazi Sweden Democrats. I should strongly stress in regards to the Sweden Democrats that they have successfully moderated now and succeeded where the BNP failed. The Sweden Democrats are now a solid and moderate part of party politics in Sweden. The case of Germany is also illustrative. By the late 1980s, the culture of contrition had fully become consensus. Anyone who questions Germany's unique guilt in World War II became tarred with neo-Nazism and the NPD. This was hugely helpful in debilitating the Republicans in the early 90s, and is a constant thorn in the side of the AFD. However, the alternative for Deutschland is an interesting example. So is the case of the Norwegian Progress Party, the Danish People's Party, Gerhard Wilders and the PVV, even UKIP to an extent. These parties never had an extremist past, and have gained significant momentum. In fact, throughout their histories, they've actually nudged further to the right than when they started. How come they can afford to do this without suffering severe repercussions? Well, it seems to be what Elizabeth Ivarsflatten calls a reputational shield. These parties or persons gained legitimacy, a host of moderates, and a strong organisational capacity 
prior to the shifts towards radical politics. The AFD started as a party against the EU, against the Euro, were largely composed of university professors and decried European bailout packages. Both the Norwegian Progress Party and the Danish People's Party have their origins in anti-taxation. Gert Wilders cut his teeth in the VVD, and UKIP were basically a single-issue party until Alan Sked's departure in 1997. Rather than marking out extremist territory and then clawing their way for recognition, these parties started life as loud-mouthed, but not radical, political groups. This enabled them to build up their internal infrastructure, garner an experienced cadre, and then subsequently shift rightward. So, when establishment parties attempted to sever any semblance of legitimacy with the Nazi or racist label, it became difficult. In fact, it didn't work. I can't think of a case, in fact, where it has worked. Well, not now, anyway. So, to conclude, the neo-Nazi, or the racist, or the extremist, or whatever you want to call it, is actually a constituent part of European politics. The establishment uses the neo-Nazi to maintain a party's ghetto status, i.e. the BNP, to tear it apart from the inside, i.e. with Combat 18, to dissuade the public from airing certain political grievances, as with the Sweden Democrats, or failing that, the state will actively create and sustain neo-Nazi groups through informants for the same ends, for example with the National Democratic Party in Germany. Just something I thought I'd make a quick video about. Coming up next, finally, is the video on UKIP. Thanks a lot for watching this video. If you liked the video, don't forget to click like and please subscribe if you haven't already. If you didn't like the video, click dislike, leave a comment and tell me where I went wrong. As always, massive thank you to all my patrons. If it's within your means to do so and you like what I do, then please do consider becoming a patron yourself. Thanks a lot, guys, and until next time.